Hello, in this video we're talking about the size of the nucleus. How big is it? How do we know? Here we go. Alright, first let's remember the first thing we did to figure out that there is a nucleus. There was a famous experiment, um, the Geiger-Marsden experiment. You want to know it. You definitely need to know the Geiger-Marsden experiment. What was it? What did it find? Um, essentially, here's what happens in Rutherford scattering is you fire alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil to figure out like what you know atoms are made of. Um, and what we saw was an incredible thing. It was like firing cannonballs of tissue paper, and every once in a while it came back, and they're like, oh my gosh, this is not plum pudding at all. Something else is happening. Um, yeah, and the thing that was happening was we realized there must be a dense, positively charged nucleus. All the positive charge in an atom must be condensed towards the middle. Right? So this is Rutherford scattering, this idea that when you do this specific experiment, you get these specific results, that most of your alpha particles go straight through the foil like we thought, but some of them get scattered pretty significantly. Some of them even get backscattered, get, get bounced backwards. And all of that told us that there's like this little thing in the middle, it's a positive charge. Um, yeah, and even like the number that went through, the number that went over here, the angles they went at, all that, they put into a formula and were able to kind of predict what was going to happen. Right? Um, so that's this idea of what Rutherford scattering is, just as a recap. It's one of the big methods we can use to figure out how big the nucleus is, because some of this can tell us a little bit about that. All right, there's three methods for measuring the size of the nucleus. We're going to talk about them in terms of like increasing um, effectiveness. All right, so the first one is just a real rough guess that we kind of started with. This is one that the IB asks you to do a lot. Um, all right, because you can do this problem even without talking about the size of the nucleus. But here's what we do. Um, you can get a very rough like order of magnitude estimate with a very, very simple conservation of energy problem. All right, so what they're gonna do, uh, they do these all the time in the IB exam, is they say you calculate the distance of closest approach. This is a big deal one. Because the idea is you're shooting alpha particles, right? Picture what's happening. They're positively charged. The nucleus is a very, very positively charged, so it repels them. So they come in with some energy, but they're going to slow down, slow down, slow down, and stop at some distance, the closest distance that they get, and then they'll turn around and come flying back, right, if you hit it, like, dead on. Um, okay, so here's all it is. It's conservation of energy. They start with a whole bunch of kinetic energy, and we're going to assume zero potential. We're going to assume we're far enough away that we can say, yeah, it's, like, got zero potential energy. Um, we're doing that zero at infinity thing. All right, so we're assuming that they start with all kinetic energy, and then at this point, the closest point, they stop, right? And since they stop, they got no kinetic energy, so this is a straight-up all kinetic turns into all potential, a very easy conservation of energy problem. You're just going to use your equation for electric potential energy from topic 10 in the data booklet. Multiply Coulomb's constant by the two charges together, divide by the distance between them. That's how much potential energy you got stored between two charges at any given moment. And... In other words, the electric field did all that negative work on the charge to take away its kinetic energy, right? So it comes in with that much kinetic energy. It turns into this. If I know how much kinetic energy they came out with or the speed of the, and the mass of the particles or whatever, I can calculate R. And this is not really the radius of the nucleus, but it gives a very rough estimate. Again, like an order of magnitude estimate. We can round about, figure out it's like, you know, close-ish to 10 to the minus 15 or something like that, roughly, roughly, roughly. Um... Yeah, so this was the first method they used to kind of like ballpark estimate how big the nucleus was. Um, and especially, again, the IB will just ask you to do this problem. They'll say, what is the distance of closest approach when you shoot an alpha particle with, you know, whatever, 300 million electron volts of kinetic energy at a nucleus of gold? And they'll give you the numbers you need. So just know that you can do this because there's no equation in the data booklet for the distance of closest approach because you just got to know it's just you just use conservation of energy. Just apply good old classic physics. All right. So that's method number one. How big is the nucleus? Do this. Conservation of energy. Um, okay. There is some fun caveats to what happens because they kept trying to go faster and faster. Like, okay, let's see how close we can get it. And at some point, this happened. So they figured out what was going on with the nucleus and said, okay, as we shoot it faster and faster and faster, um, we should get different amounts backscattered that come backwards. Well, the results were very different from what we expected. And what we found was that really high energies, um, there were less and less particles being backscattered. Think about what we know now about the strong force and think about why that might be. Well, what happens is this thing gets close enough, it gets so close to the nucleus that the strong force turns on and it's like, and it gets sucked in, right? It gets attracted and gets absorbed essentially into the nucleus. 
right? Um, so this observation was evidence for the strong force. So if they ask you, how did we figure out that there's like a strong force? It was this, it was called, we say it's deviation from Rutherford scattering. The normal scattering pattern we saw changes when you shoot them really, really fast because you shoot them so fast that they go penetrate the nucleus, basically get close enough that the strong force takes over and then they just don't come back at all. Yeah. Um, so they have to be really fast because they're repelled. Yeah. So you got to shoot them fast enough to get into the range of the strong force. So like 28 million electron volts or something. So that number I said a second ago is insane, but there you go. Okay. Some other equations in the data booklet. There's an equation for nuclear size and for reasons uh, that we don't need to worry about. You can do some math on this whole crazy uh, high energy Rutherford scattering stuff where the things get a, um, we shoot them fast enough for the alpha particles to penetrate the nucleus. And by doing that, they did some math and said, how big is the nucleus? Well, it's yay big. All right, here's an equation in your data booklet for the radius of a nucleus, depending on how many nucleons are in it, how many total protons and neutrons. All right, what you do is you take this number, which is in the front of your data booklet, the Fermi radius, and that's a data booklet number uh, on your list of constants. Um, yeah, so the radius of the nucleus equals some constant times the nucleon number to the one third, AKA the cube root. Yes, of course, math people, make sure you're cool that this is the same thing as a cube root. All right, so cube root, think about why. Think about how volume works, yeah? Volume, you like cube your radius or something. Um, and I think if you like add three more, triple, triple your nuclei, you triple the volume, not the radius, yeah? Um, so think a little bit about this mathematically. Think about your volume formula for a sphere because these things will roughly organize themselves into a sphere. But this equation is real, generally pretty easy to use. They love doing ratios with it though. Yeah, so you just put in like, okay, uranium-235, it's got 235 nucleons. I cube root 235, multiply by this number, that's about how big the nucleus is in radius. Like, so just one dimension across, yeah. Um, okay, so what this works out to is make sure you can convince yourself of this. Again, think about the area for density, mass over volume. Mass depends on the number of nuclei. Volume also does, because you're gonna cube radius, and so volume will be proportional to just A, not the cube root of A, which should make sense if you just think about what volume means. So roughly speaking, all nuclei have the same density. Um, the density of a carbon nucleus is the same as the density of a uranium nucleus, there's just a ton of them, all right? It's about as dense as anything can be without turning into something crazy like a black hole. Uh, so it's really, 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 really high, super, super dense, because remember, all that matter is in very small, very small space, all right? So use this equation. If they talk about the size of a nucleus, the density of a nucleus, you gotta do, you know, think about mass over volume, think about volume of a sphere, have some fun with that, do some practice, uh, they're not too bad. Last method, the best method we have for estimating the size of a nucleus. This pesky strong force keeps messing stuff up. We try to shoot alpha particles at the nucleus. It like uh, gets ricocheted away before it can get too close or it gets too close and then it gets just absorbed in. No good. So why not shoot something at the nucleus that doesn't interact with the strong force? Something like a lepton, our favorite lepton, the electron. That's what we do. We shoot electrons, all right? We shoot high energy electrons at the nucleus because they won't be affected by the strong force. And um, as we saw with our matter wave stuff, when you shoot electrons, they can act like waves. If you fire them at just the right speed and get them at just the right wavelength, the Broly wavelength. Um, so what happens is an electron wave uh, interacts with a nuclei, a nucleus, um, and it's gonna diffract around it because it treats it like a barrier. And this is a really, really, really good method for getting nuclear size because again, we're not limited by um, the range of the strong force or the strong force messing with our alpha particles or anything like that. The electron just kind of diffract around and don't mess with the nucleus too much. So it gives us very accurate results. So you just want to know this is the best method that we have for measuring the size of the nucleus um, that we're going to talk about. And so that's what we do, all right? Um, so we use the same equation as for small angle approximation. Look at the small angle, or sorry, for um, single slit diffraction which is like wavelength over B, I think we use in small and uh, single slit uh, because B is the size of the opening. Here D is just like the size of the barrier that you're diffracting around and the barrier happens to be a nucleus, which is what we're trying to measure, All right? So we're using the same equation basically from um, single slit diffraction, but 
the angles end up being a little bigger than we deal with there, so we're not going to use the small angle approximation. If you care to, you can look back at how we derived that fun equation in single slit. But there you go. All right, so the electrons diffract around, and we get this fun diffraction pattern, a good old octopus, where you'll have a lot of electrons hit right here, very few electrons hit right here, a lot of electrons hit right here, very few here. You get maxima and minima, and it's like the um, regular diffraction pattern, so it's like a really, really powerful central maximum, and then the secondary maximum are pretty small. But just like in single slit, remember, this is the same as the angle in the single slit equation. It's the angle to the first minima. So it's a weird one, but it just shows you like essentially it's half of the width of the central bright spot if you want. Yeah, but that's the angle to the first minimum. So this can tell you the size of the nucleus. You fire some electrons at like gold foil or something thin. So it's only a couple atoms thick. Um, it'll hit some nuclei. It'll diffract around them. You measure the angle it diffracts by. You know how fast the things are going. You know their momentum. So you know their de Broglie wavelength. And you can calculate the, the size of the nucleus and get a really good estimate of how big it is based on how much they diffract. Okay, so there you go. There's your three methods for measuring the size of a nucleus. You shoot some alpha particles at it. You shoot some alpha particles at it real fast. Um, and you diffract some electrons around it. All right, so you want to know those, know the equations, know how to use them. Uh, again, on the actual problems, they're not too bad. So go try some, see if you can apply those ideas. Have fun.